Um, so welcome everyone. Again, if you joined late, my name is Sarah Shore. I'm here with 350.org and this is a call to talk about the National Day of Action and action happening in California for Rise for Climate Jobs and Justice on September 8th. Uh, we're really excited to have these movement leaders here joining us. Um, and um, we're gonna go ahead and just start with intros from all of our speakers, and then we'll be going into an overview of what is Rise for Climate Jobs and Justice, and, um, and hear from each of our speakers about what's going on in their respective corners of the country and world. Um, so I'm about to turn it over to our panelists to have them introduce themselves and their work. Um, I'm going to ask y'all to, to just say your name, where you're based, um, your organization, and really try and keep it to one minute. Um, but before we go ahead and get started with the call, I actually just want to take a minute to acknowledge the horrible crimes that are being perpetrated against families at the border right now. Um, we've seen children being ripped away from their parents and put in cages. Um, it's not okay. It's not moral. It's not just. Um, it's, it's horrible to see children separated from, from their families. Um, and we know so deeply the intersections between migration and climate change and that these connections and intersections are really inseparable. Um, and this is just one of the reasons why we're, we're rising up and we really are, are working to, um, to uh, just make the connections with all of our other movements for justice across the country and world. So let's take a breath. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Penny to introduce herself. Penny, go for it. Thank you, Sarah. My name is Penny Opal Plant. Uh, I am years working really hard for clean air, clean water, and clean soil and a vibrantly healthy future for generations to come. Yaki, Mexican, Choctaw, Cherokee, and European. Thank you. Penny, you broke up a little bit there, so we might, um, Avery might work with you to potentially call in. Um, I think your internet was a little bit choppy there, so we didn't catch some of that. Um, so I'm going to actually um, turn it over to Mickey, and we'll come back to you, Penny. Penny. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm Mickey Eva. Um, good morning from Manila here in the Philippines, and I'm the regional field organizer here um, with 350.org East Asia. So my focus is on, um, is on organizing, mobilizing grassroots, volunteers, partner organizations towards the global moment that is RISE. So I'll maybe pass it on to Malik. Hi, I'm uh, Malik Safir. I'm with Green Faith, uh, Interfaith Partners in Action uh, for the Earth. I'm a Green Faith Circle organizer. Uh, I'm based in Arkansas. That's in the American South. Uh, we do work around education and training and mobilizing on a multi-faith uh, level in our regions. Uh, we're currently organizing Green Face Circles in New York City, New Jersey, Colorado, North Carolina, and Arkansas. Uh, I look forward to the call. Thanks, Malik. Um, over to you, Olivia. Hey, good evening, everyone, and good morning to Mickey and others that are in the U.S. Um, so my name is Lydia Avila. I'm the executive director of the PowerShift Network. Um, I'm personally based out of Los Angeles, but uh, the PowerShift Network is a national network of over 75 youth-focused and youth-led organizations that are 
working to achieve climate justice. Um, and our members um, include small student groups on campuses and big nonprofits. Um, and we're really happy and proud to be partnering with PCM and 350 and others on this great call and um, historic action in September. Thanks, Lydia. And over to you, Patrick. Hey, everybody. My name is Patrick Houston. Um, I work with New York Communities for Change. And so we're based out of New York City. Um, and we organize in, um, on a lot of issues of racial, economic, climate justice. Uh, we target especially low-income communities and communities of color to do this work. And so what it looks like on the day-to-day -day is this work ranges from um, housing affordability to education reform, fighting labor issues, um, and as of about two and a half years ago, we had to add climate change and um, to our mix. And so that's what we're doing now. Thanks, Patrick. And Penny, you want to try again? Yeah, can you hear me? Is this better? Yeah, yeah. that sounds much better. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Penny Opal Plant. I'm Idle No More SF Bay, which is a group of indigenous people and allies working for clean air, water, soil, and a vibrantly healthy future for the next seven generations. Um, I'm Yaqui, Choctaw, Cherokee, Mexican, and European, and I'm checking in from the San Francisco East Bay, where I see the Chevron refinery every day from my home office. Glad to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we also have Avery here who is helping with, with our back end digital. So thanks for, for helping us out, Avery, um, and helped pull this call together. Um, so um, we just had intros from all of our speakers, which are coming to us from different parts of the world. We're actually, this call is gonna be more focused on what you, it's, it's targeted more for folks based in the US. Um, so we'll be talking a lot about that, but we are gonna uh, also hear about what's happening globally and specifically in East Asia. But since we just heard from all of our speakers, uh, it would be great to hear from participants on the call. Uh, if you could type into the chat, uh, we have people from all over the country on the call today and we, see, we wanna see more about where everyone is coming from. So if you could take a second to type in the chat, What's your name? Where are you sitting right now? And what brought you to this call? How'd you hear about it? Take a second to do that. Oh, we have Esau. Pretty sure Esau is in Alaska. New Hampshire, California, Albuquerque, New Jersey, Baltimore going too fast for me to even keep track of. Um, well, welcome everyone to the call. Wow, people from all over, thank you. This is wonderful to see. Pensacola, Oakland, New York, North Carolina, Denver, all over the country. So thanks everyone for joining. It's great to see folks calling in from everywhere. Um, oh, we have someone from Italy based in Virginia. Um, okay, thanks everyone. So uh, what is Rise for Climate Jobs and Justice? Um, so we, as we all know, 2016 and 2017 were the hottest years on record. And over the past year across the country, we've seen major hurricanes, we've seen flooding, we've seen drought. Here in California, we've seen massive fires hit, um, even outside of fire season. And we're really at a crossroads. We could either continue business as usual and watch our communities and our climate continue to suffer, or we can really be rising up and showing that our communities have the power to make change globally. So this is really, uh, September 8th is our opportunity to demonstrate that communities are leading on the solutions and the transition and are shaping the politics we need to see on a livable planet. So, so on September 8th, we're going to be mobilizing in San Francisco and also in communities across the globe to push for bold action on climate jobs and justice. We'll be having a massive event in San Francisco and distributed events across the country and the world. 
And the vision for this day is to really help build ongoing relationships, ongoing campaigns, and really show the power of the climate movement ahead of the 2018 elections. So a few days after we mobilize, California Governor Jerry Brown will be hosting a global climate summit in San Francisco where announcements are gonna be made from local governments, politicians, private sector, on what they're doing on climate. And by mobilizing a few days ahead of the summit, we're, we're, our goal is to really raise the bar on climate action and climate leadership and make sure that the summit is held to the highest standards. Um, and we wanna be highlighting the community-driven solutions that we're already showing across the country and that we're demanding. So with that, at, I'm going to actually turn it over to our speakers to really illustrate what's happening across the country, not just on September 8th, but also the opportunity to organize in the lead up and aftermath of uh, September 8th, Rise for Climate Jobs and Justice. So I'm going to, we're going to zoom out to begin with and start with Nikki, uh, who's based in Manila. And um, Nikki, I'm turning it over to you. Cool, thanks Sarah. So again, good morning from Manila and I'm very excited to work on this global moment because of its really decentralized approach and just the richness of creative ideas coming in from all parts of the world, including Asia, making it truly a people power movement from the grassroots up. So Rise for Climate is of a particular importance for Asia because of the immense growth in the region and the large energy demand for decades to come here. Um, Southeast Asia, for example, specifically Indonesia, here in the Philippines and Vietnam, have large coal projects being built right now or are in the pipeline, where in other parts of the world it's already been phased out, right? In East Asia, particularly China, Japan, and South Korea, um, these countries and corporations there are financing or investing in most of these um, coal projects and other fossil fuel projects. And in terms of political strategy, the COP International will be go is, is going to be held around the same week as RISE, and right before GCAS, it's going to be held in Bangkok in Thailand. Therefore, there is an urgent need for our Asian constituency and movement here to rise for climate and demand our local and national leaders to say no to coal and fossil fuels and push a transition to renewable energy. Having said that, our key locations for RISE actions are going to be Indonesia and Philippines, Japan and Thailand. In the Philippines and Indonesia, we are organizing actions to demand our local leaders to stop new coal projects. We engage our partners such as climate reality projects in the Philippine and Indonesia, um, the Philippine Movement for Climate Justice, PMCJ, um, and support actions across um, the country, such as marches, um, local actions at city halls, etc. We also support our 350 volunteers in these countries and also in Vietnam to send this clear message loud and clear. Our 350 Japan team has been doing some amazing work in our divestment campaign, targeting the three major big banks in Japan, which are still financing these coal and fossil fuel projects. We will continue this momentum and mobilize to rise and stop financial institutions from bankrolling all these um, projects. In Thailand, we are working with our partner um, Climate Watch Thailand, a, gra a huge grassroots organization in, in Thailand, and their large network of anti-coal movement, which includes farmers, fisher folks, women, and youth, to fight these coal projects, such as those in Tepa and Krabi. We are supporting this movement by helping with both online and offline um, organizing and campaigning, and we also have a lot of capacity building activities um, in the lead up to RISE. Um, these, these include topics such as climate and gender, um, climate impacts, so that we can engage the grassroots communities and grow the movement and also um, make it um, more impactful. Our networks have also um, planning various smaller actions and communities um, activities in Bangkok during the intersessional, such as press conferences, um, actions outside at the sidelines of the, of the intersessional um, activities. And even beyond these um, key locations, we also have a lot of exciting actions across East Asia. We have an artivism action in Taipei, Taiwan, 
a climate march 1.5 and rise and play activity in South Korea, our e-forum in Hong Kong. Um, we also have a virtual march with really cool Pixel 6 here in the Philippines, zero, camp, zero carbon campuses and solar power talk in China, um, a climate boot camp and recruitment training in Malaysia, and some others being planned by volunteers or partners in the region. You know, moving forward, these mobilizations and actions are very critical in demanding concrete actions from local, national, and even regional leaders. As these happen after um, RISE, we have the ASEAN Regional Bloc Summit in Singapore, the World Bank IMF meeting in Bali, Indonesia, um, the Green Climate Fund or GCF board meeting in Incheon in South Korea. So there's a really critical uh, moment to um, rise. Furthermore, it will be we will be integrating all these partners and volunteers into the bigger and um, longer running fossil free campaign to one, stop new fossil fuel projects, especially coal, two, divest from these fossil fuels, and three, push for an aggressive transition to 100% renewables. So that's all. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks so much, Mickey. I love hearing all of the events and, and I think um, it's really cool to just hear about the diversity of different kinds of events about what works for folks locally and really being able to um, to change to fit what works for communities locally. Thank you so much, Mickey. Um, and with that, I as, as we know, the work doesn't just start on September 8th. We aren't having this mobilization separate from a lot of the ongoing campaigns that we're all running across the country. And so I wanna turn it over to Malik from uh, Green Faith and also representing PCM, who will tell us a little bit more about some of the ongoing work that's happening in the lead up and um, in different places being prioritized by the People's Climate Movement across the country. Malik, go for it. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm excited to be on this call. Uh, we are rising, and a part of us rising is to realize that people have, in many ways, felt that they've been left behind in the movement. And so we're returning to these communities who have been, in many ways, marginalized by certain power brokers, uh, politicians, uh, lobbyists, corporate lobbyists, uh, uh, and, you know, uh, industries that have actually been crippling the effort to move forward. And so as a result of that, Green Faith and the People's Climate Movement have come together with other key partners to uh, let people know that they're not alone in this fight anymore. Uh, that even though they may be locally fighting on the ground against whoever their, uh, their key uh, op opponents are against these initiatives, that there are people organizing throughout the nation and throughout the world uh, with them, uh, so they're not alone. Uh, we're also uh, letting them know that we are aware that this is the time now to act at a local level and that the global attention and national attention we have been seeing, uh, we're trying to make sure that that national attention gets to the local level so that people on the local level would know how to make it personal and also uh, make it connect to what they've already been doing. And as a result of that, we're moving intentionally into uh, poor people's communities, people of color communities, indigenous communities, and letting them know that there are allies who are willing to work with them now, leading up to the September event, to uh, begin to mobilize a mass kind of media campaign where they would know as one voice and as one group moving together through this movement that we are serious about the changes that need to be made as it relates to transitioning off of uh, fossil fuel to clean energy and renewable energy, uh, creating sustainable uh, communities, divesting in uh, uh, fossil fuel and reinvesting in uh, energy sources that are more sustainable and also protect the environment. So as a result of that, Green Faith is working with the People's Climate Movement to uh, move in three areas. One, for those who still need education and training to equip them with the resources and the relationships they need to become more informed and know exactly what steps they need to take moving forward to make their issues not only just uh, real and relevant, but also realized in the next political elections that are coming forward. Uh, two, we are on the ground working with existing campaigns, uh, showing how those campaigns are connected to the People's Climate Movement and with what we're doing with fake leaders through Green Faith so that we'll have a unified front on the front lines where people who have seen themselves working in silos 
would now see themselves a part of a larger initiative and now began to work uh, pretty much as a vanguard uh, to show that there is no division in our ranks, uh, that we're, we're poised now to move forward in a way that we did not in the past. And three, and most, the third thing and most importantly is organizing. Because a lot of times when you have organizations that we realize have been crippled, a lot of that crippling has been done because the local people have felt like they have not had the power to speak for themselves. And so as community organizers on the ground, uh, with the green faith circles, with our other multi, multi faith uh, and interfaith leaders, as well as with uh, unions uh, who have already been organizing around labor, we're trying to bring everyone together to say that the people's stories matter. Collect the stories, uh, present the stories to politicians and the representatives of those communities who are supposed to be leaders. And if those stories are not enough, then let the people find ways to stand for themselves in a way and stand up for themselves in a way that they haven't before. And that requires organizing them and giving them the resources that they need on the ground to speak as, in one voice as leaders. Uh, so going forward, September 8th is just uh, a catalyst for uh, what we're planning to go, do up to the midterm elections, because we're hoping that with this unison and voice, unison and demonstration, and the kind of pressure that we're planning to put on those who are in opposition uh, for the transitions that need to be made, ju made justly, economically, as well as through energy uh, sources, we're hoping that we can begin to persuade politicians who have not been on our side to shift their position to come to our side. And then also we're hoping to uh, help candidates who are on our side who are not elected to get elected. Uh, and then from that, we were hoping from the midterm election to move forward towards the presidential election so that we'll know that these movements that we're having is one step further to making the, the agenda that has been a local agenda for people who have been harmed, uh, poor people, people of color and indigenous people, to make it a national agenda by having representatives on the national level and the local level reflect who we are and what our needs and our demands are. So, as, uh, so going forward, these are the things that we're looking for our partners to do in a real way, and that is to help us identify uh, the organizations and the people who need education and training, help us also identify campaigns that are currently going or campaigns that need to be revitalized or resurrected so that they can join the People's Climate Movement, and then three, help us organize those who have been disempowered to realize their civic duty and responsibility to engage on a civic level to help us shift the political climate in favor of climate justice. Thanks so much, Malik. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to, to talk about the ongoing work and the really um, being more inclusive of folks who have been left out of this movement for a very long time. So thank you for speaking to that. Um, Okay, I'm gonna move us into uh, to Penny to talk about California and what's happening in San Francisco. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Can y'all hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm, I've been an activist for a very, very long time since about 1981, and. Um, Looking at the history of the United Nations and the COPs that have been happening, you know, we're heading into the 24th COP. And obviously they have not done their job because if they had been doing their job, then we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now with, you know, each year having more serious climate disruptions, fires. I don't need to go through the list because you all know what that list is. And so here we have um, these leaders, including UN leaders, meeting in San Francisco on uh, September 12th to 14th. And they're still focusing on the issues that are taking us down the road to continue the, fo the for fossil fuel industry to continue, when that's one of the main problems in increasing global temperatures. And so we know what we need, especially as indigenous people, we are still here. You know, we are still here because our ancestors uh, were resilient and strong and creative and resourceful. And I think that we have a lot to be able to survive 500 years of genocide and we're still here. So I just want to say, 
you know, we know who the real climate leaders are. It's all of us. You know, people keep looking outside of their, themselves and their own communities to give that authority to people that obviously don't deserve it because they haven't done enough yet. And so that's one of the messages that I really like to impart and help people empower themselves in their communities to do what's necessary right now to preserve life going into seven generations into the future at the very least. And so we know in our communities what the real solutions are. You know, they're in our communities. We're already doing things in our communities to help us survive what's coming. And um, I'm really excited about what we're planning for September 8th in San Francisco. Um, it's gonna be really awesome. We are having the largest climate march ever to happen on the West Coast. So the goal, initial goal, was 50,000 people. And I was the first person to say, um, you know, given where we are in history, that this is a very different year than 2014 with the largest climate march in the United States in New York, or last year with the climate march, the PCM climate march in Washington, D.C. California was on fire, as were a number of other states. We're just crawling out of the drought that looks like it's going to continue. And so I am imagining, and I invite all of us to imagine, whatever community that we're in, imagining all the people who have been watching all of this happen around there in their communities and, and wondering what they can do. Well, this is what they can do. They can join all of us on September 8th in actions around the country and around the world. And in San Francisco, there'll be a huge march. It'll end at Civic Center Plaza. There are going to be 75 street murals planted, uh, painted, uh, planted in the street. And when those people going that are participating in Jerry Brown's GCAS gonna walk by those streets, they're gonna see our messaging. And as I don't know more, we've done these street murals and they only take about an hour to an hour and a half. And it's been so inspiring to see passersby join us and say, what are you doing? And taking their coats off and paint with us. So that's one of the things that I'm really excited about. Um, our next organizing meeting is this coming Monday. And if you're listening from Northern California, it will be at the Episcopal Church of St. John the Evangelist at 1661 15th Street and Julian in San Francisco from 5.30 to 8.30. You can find more information about that on the Idle No More SFB Facebook page and on the California Rise for Climate Jobs and Justice uh, website. Um, additionally, following the, the March on September 8th, It Takes Roots is organizing several days of actions that include an art build, um, a salute solidarity to Solutions Summit with solutions from communities like ours being presented and uh, direct actions rolling out that week. So I encourage all of us to stand strong together. We're the ones we've been waiting for. No one's gonna come to save us and we are the climate leaders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Penny. Um, maybe you could uh, drop the event for the California organizing meeting or someone could in the chat box so folks can, uh, if you're in Northern California, come out to that meeting. Um, and we'll also have an interactive question later in the call about how folks can be, get better involved in both California and nationally. Um, so if you were inspired by these last three speakers, um, I encourage you to take out your phone for one second and um, join our texting updates. So you can do that by uh, texting RISE, R-I-S-E, to the number 83224. Again, that's texting 83224. And in the text, put the word rise, and that'll subscribe you to our texting update so you can learn about all of the updates happening. Um, so again, that's rise to the number 83224. Um, so with that, I would like to um, turn it over to Lydia Avila to talk more about what youth are doing to come together and organize across the country. 
Lydia. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, what an impressive group of panelists to follow. So I'm going to try my best to, to do it justice here. Um, so yeah, young people are joining and leading mobile, uh, mobilization efforts on September 8th. And um, the thing that's really, really interesting about this kind of younger generation is that we've always lived in a world where climate change is a reality. It's not a theory or some looming far off threat, right? It's happening all around us. It's right here. It's right now. And young people are invested in it because it's our entire lives and that of the small children in our lives. Like I personally have a three-year-old niece who I think about all the time when I'm doing this work. Um, so on September 8th, we're particularly excited about showing public officials that it's not enough to accept the science of climate change or even to give it lip service when you're on a campaign trail, right? We get a lot of that promises that aren't kept. We need a world, we need, and the world needs uh, true climate champions. And that means rejecting any notion that fossil fuels have anything to do in any part of our future, um, carrying forward initiatives that'll make a transition to a clean renewable energy future a priority and that keeps workers and communities who are bearing the biggest burden of climate change front and center, similar to what Malik was saying. Um, and we think that young people are kind of poised to do this and that's the reason that PowerShift Network even exists is because young people have always been at the forefront of mass social movements and they're typically the ones that are calling for the boldest actions, the policies that go the furthest, pushing and really settling for nothing less than what's absolutely critical. Um, and the climate movement and this September mobilization are no exceptions. Um, similar to the Parkland students' message about exposing and getting gun-friendly politicians out of office, which we were so inspired by earlier this year and, this year and continue to be, uh, the youth climate movement is exposing ties to these so-called leaders and that, that they have to the fossil fuel industry and forcing them to pick a side. You're either with the public or you're in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry, and you can't have it both ways one or the other. Um, and so far, the Sunrise Movement, which is one of the members of the PowerShift Network, have gotten over 500 public officials to sign the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge. Um, and as the name suggests, it's a promise to not take any money from the fossil fuel industry. And I'm sure many of you on this call can appreciate how huge that is to get folks to commit to that. Um, so for September 8th, young people are looking to actions that are really gonna catch the attention of these decision makers and the world. Um, and we know that size isn't everything, although very impressive to have huge mobilizations. Sometimes it takes simply the right target, the right message, or even the right sign to make a big splash. So we want these actions on our end to be fun, to be inspiring, and to make our public officials sit up and make take note. So we're really encouraging folks to get creative on what they do. Um, and, um, and finally, I'll say that September 8th is a jumping off point. We, we're, <clears throat> we stand on a peak and really speak our truth on that day. And then we're off to the polls. Um, it's kind of a race after that because um, I read somewhere that approximately 4 million people are turning 18 this year. <laughs> so we see this as both an opportunity and a challenge. We have a lot of work to do to get these young adults and the many, many others for whom voting maybe is not even on their radar out to the polls during these midterm elections leading all the way to November. Um, I'll leave it at that. I can't wait to dig into this with all of you on this call. Um, and thank you for being part of this work. Thanks so much, Lydia. It's obviously super inspiring to see the leadership that youth are taking um, across the country over the past year and for generations back. So thank you. Um, and um, we are going to close out our speaker program with Patrick talking a little bit about what's happening in in New York. And and just before you go, Patrick, just we've we've now touched on a bunch of the global events that are happening in in East Asia. We've talked about the ongoing organizing. We've talked about what's happening in California, and with the youth. And um, this isn't just happening in California. We're we're mobilizing all over the U.S. And so uh, Patrick is going to talk about what's happening in New York, which has been a place where we've seen a ton of really amazing wins over the last year. Um, so Patrick, I'll turn it over to you. Hey everybody. Uh, first off, I just wanna reiterate, like I'm really excited to be here doing this important work with all of you. I mean, it's crazy when you zoom out and think about like this time in history and our role in it and how people in the future or children, grandchildren are gonna look back and be like, who was doing what, you know, and why weren't they doing more? 
And so I'm glad it's really exciting to be here with all of you to be part of those people that are trying to do more. Um, so with before I jump into how we've been preparing here in New York City um, for this action, um, I just want to brief over a previous action uh, when I first started with New York Communities for Change. So I started, uh, or a previous campaign. So I started just last year in the fall, and I came in in the middle of the divestment fight that was happening here in New York City. That was the, the efforts to get the New York City Pension Fund to divest it um, from the fossil fuel industry. And so I came in at the end of this fight. Um, we were working with 350. We were working with Divest Invest. Um, PCM New York and a lot of other groups also played um, helpful roles, integral roles in getting us to where we needed to be. And in this process, we had our particular target. It was the New York City Pension, you know, the Board of Trustees. Specifically, it was Comptroller, the Comptroller who controls the board, Comptroller Stringer. And it was uh, months of persistent bird dogs, pickets, LTs, I'm sure all of you on this call know the deal, um, to get them to where they needed to be. And then it was around that time, it was in, in September, October, late October last year, um, October 29th, we had a large mobilization. Um, it was a march across the Brooklyn Bridge, and it was around the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, which devastated especially New Jersey and New York uh, five years ago at the time. And so we had a big mobilization there. Um, about 5,000 people turned out, marched across the bridge, demanding um, various climate objectives, justice objectives, and making sure that the targets, um, at this time it was the comptroller, it was the mayor, um, and a little bit of it was state level, so the governor, making sure that those targets were clearly identified. And so that's what makes me excited for, and, 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 and well, the last important part is that it was soon after that march, and again, in addition to all the other pickets and bird dogs and um, actions that were happening, that the comptroller's office came out and finally said that they're committing to a plan to divest New York City's pension fund. So $4 billion, which they're planning um, in the process now of setting up the necessary structures to divest that pension fund. And so what we have, you know, I feel like what we're going into now is another amazing opportunity for us us being here in New York City, in New York State, across the country, and as we can see from this call, even globally, to um, bring this targeted pressure, coming in with these, ult you know, addressing these ultimate issues of climate change, of the inequalities inextricably linked to it, and tagging the particular targets to it. And it's especially exciting because we're right before the midterms, um, and also because of the buzz that the Global Climate Summit itself is already going to build. And so that makes the potential, the potential impact for this action that much more powerful. Um, so it's really exciting going into that. So let me explain a little bit about how we've been beginning to prepare here in New York City. So my organization, our organization is one of uh, more than 30 at this point that are working under the leadership um, uh, or at least the coordination of People's Climate Movement New York. Um, so it's about 30 organizations, many based out of the city. It's labor groups. It's um, um, faith-based faith institutions. Um, it's climate justice, environmental justice. Um, all of these so far, it's 30 and counting that are beginning this work to spread the word for this um, action and get more groups and more individuals and more communities engaged. And so how exactly have we been doing that thus far? I won't go into too much detail, but I will give you just some ideas to hopefully conjure up some thoughts and some inspiration for um, as you all begin your outreach in your communities. And so for about six weeks ago, there was the initial meeting. And since then, there's been about bi-weekly meetings where all the groups come together. We've since divided into about four subcommittees one that plans the key components of the action, um, another that plans the key components of um, the, um, hold up, yeah, of the action itself, um, then the groups that are gonna be doing the outreach, um, and then we have the, uh, give me one minute. 
I want to make sure I get these groups right. Yeah, yeah. And then we have the groups that are deciding the who are going to be the what's going to be the core demands for New York City's mobilization. And then one with the core logistics, like the date and the time. And then we all come together. The four subcommittees come together every two weeks to provide feedback for everyone. And then from there, we make decisions on how we're going to move forward all together. And so the thing that's been very evident so far is that the more that the details um, get secure, the more the enthusiasm builds for organizations to participate. Once they see that this is something tangible that's coming into, into place, more groups have been um, more willing to get involved in the planning processes and also committing to, to turnout and to supporting, um, whether it's with the turnout itself, preparation, or donating finances, or office space, or printing capabilities, et cetera. And so, for our organization and so many of the organizations that we're working with here in the state, there are many campaigns that we're running already um, that this mass mobilization gives us an awesome opportunity to contribute, and then it's also going to help us um, elevate our campaigns. And so just in a nutshell, there's three core campaigns. We have two, we being New York Communities for Change, are working with many other groups in the city and many other groups in the state with um, two state level coalitions. One is New York Renews and it's pressing for two very comprehensive just transitions to 100% renewable energy by 2050 in New York State. And then the second main statewide coalition that we're part of is the uh, All Fossil Fuels Coalition. And this is the aggregation of all of the individual fights across the state to stop fossil fuel infrastructure, to stop this pipeline, to stop this power plant, um, this bomb train, all coming together. And so because so many of these groups have been able to work together already and use their contacts and their networks to build the base, we have come to three core demands that we as the entire mobilization that's happening in New York City have decided on. And so that's ultimately rise for climate, jobs and justice. And we're calling on Governor Cuomo, we're calling on the mayor, and we're calling on all elected officials to one, move to 100, first off, move off fossil fuel infrastructure. And then move to 100% renewable energy now. And then the third component is um, the third demand is to make polluters pay. And so what these three core demands, the way these work out for all of these organizations across New York State that are and New York City that are participating in this mobilization is that they're broad enough that the demands of so many fall, fit into uh, these ultimate demands. Um, and so I'm really excited to see how we can we can continue to mobilize, continue to get other groups engaged and have their messaging um, tied into this. Um, and so it's been stated before and alluded to before, but um, in closing, I just wanna emphasize that it's obvious, but it's important. I mean, this mobilization, this work that we're doing to make this a powerful event, to make sure that the general message of climate issues is tied to it, as well as our particular demands throughout all the participating organizations are tied to it. It all depends, it, you know, it's, it's, it's as big as we make it. It's obvious, but it's as big as we make it. And so right now we have a swelling concern that you see across the country, across the world about the awareness of climate change. And you also see swelling enthusiasm for climate solutions. And so we have an awesome opportunity to tap into this, this September. And I'm really excited to see how these, you know, how things here in New York City continue to develop and then to see how all the other actions are popping up um, around the country and around the world. So awesome working with all of you. Really excited to see how this is, how this is going to play out, how we're going to make this play out. Whew. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, that gave me the chills. Um, really inspiring to hear from all of you. Um, so 
uh, what I want to do now is just uh, give a basic overview of what you heard from just now and give folks uh, we're going to open up a little bit more interactive part of the call where I'm going to ask you guys to answer some questions for us. So um, as we know, Patrick just laid out uh, a really, just a really good pitch for why this is so important to mobilize right now. And we're asking folks that if you can get to San Francisco to, to the big anchor mobilization in San Francisco, you should do that. That's where you should be going. If you can't get to San Francisco, there are amazing events like what Patrick is talking about in New York happening, being organized, pulled together all over the country. And if there isn't an event where you are, you can start one. You can start building that coalition. You can start working with your neighbors. You can really start, uh, start organizing. We all have to start somewhere. It's okay if there isn't a huge coalition built up yet. We, we have to plug in where we can. Um, and you all have the power to really do that. So um, we are less than three months out and we need everyone to get to work to really make these actions big and beautiful and powerful. So here are the things that you can expect from us. And when I say us, I mean 350, PCM, Sierra Club, all of the groups that are represented on this call and um, over a hundred organizations that have already signed on to partner on Rise for Climate Jobs and Justice. So you can expect from us, um, we'll be hosting regular calls for event organizers uh, where we'll be training on recruitment, media, digital skills, and best practices for event planning to, to help get the ball rolling. So if you sign up to host an event, uh, be assured that you will get support to help do that. Uh, we'll also be hosting calls like this every once in a while to get more people excited, learning about what's happening around the country um, and plugged in. We'll be sharing artwork, digital posts, uh, stories that really help build the hype. Um, you know, a few of our panelists talked about how important it is to just be telling our stories. Um, and we really want to get the stories out there of regular people who are fighting across the country and coming up with the solutions that we need to be pushing for. Um, so I have a few asks for you. So if you can turn your attention to your computer right now, um, there are going to be a few boxes that pop up with some asks for you. Uh, the first ask is if you are part of an organization and you want to figure out how to plug in your uh, base of people, um, press yes, my organization is plugged in or not yet, uh, we're not yet plugged in, but we're excited and we wanna be. Um, if you are in California and you wanna plug into the efforts there, press one of the options below. Uh, there's recruitment, logistics, faith outreach, youth engagement. Uh, all of these are being worked through in working groups in California and we need more folks to plug in. Uh, our first mass meeting in California turned out hundreds of people with lines down the block and it's going to be big and we need help making it even bigger. And then the third question on your screen is if you're an individual who's excited about making rise of success in your community and you're outside of California, let us know how you might do that. Um, so you could lead or you could lead your own action or assist in planning an action that's already being planned in your community. You could support logistics. You could do outreach to members of your community. So go around uh, to um, canvassing in your neighborhood or at community events that will be happening throughout the summer. Um, you can create arts and do creative resistance. Or you can support with digital and comm support. So go through those three questions. Uh, you can sort of scroll down and answer, answer them on your screen. We'll be capturing this information and following up with you um, for whatever you stepped up for. So I'll give folks a minute to go in, answer the questions. They're gonna disappear from your screen in a second. So please go ahead and, and answer them. And while folks are answering them, or if you're done answering the questions, um, if you could type into the chat, 
what is one thing that you are already doing in your community to make Rise a success? You can type this into the chat. Something that you're already doing. Oh, and it looks like I'm getting a notification from, from someone that we, that you have to answer all three questions. Is that right, Avery? That is correct. Okay. My apologies. So if, if one of them doesn't apply to you, you're going to have to put in a, an answer, even though it doesn't apply to you. And sorry about that technical difficulty, but in order to submit your thing. So please answer all three questions. Um, all right, so we have some, uh, we have some answers in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, we have someone, uh, who's taking part in RISE conference calls. Uh, we have folks who are already reaching out to their friends to, to save the date on September 8th and join, join the mobilization. Um, someone is working on a documentary about what to do about climate disruption. Um, communicating with people inside and outside of my organization online. Um, networking with environmental and faith-based groups and individuals to help bring them in. Um, started talking to potential partners. Um, lots of work already happening in communities. Is there any panelist that wants to speak to any of the work y'all are doing? And I know folks spoke to this already, but suggestions on ways that folks can start to plug in to make Rise a success quickly for maybe 30 seconds. Uh, panelists, if you wanna speak up, you can. If not, that's fine. But if someone wants to speak to this question, Penny, you want to go for it? Which question was it? I'm sorry. Just uh, things that folks can do to plug in in their communities now uh, to help. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it's important for us to remember that we're living in probably the most critical time for our human species. And it, it requires us to do things that, that we wouldn't normally do. Um, I, I have been at meetings where my hands shake, where my lips stick to my teeth because I'm nervous, and, and I know that I still need to do that. And so it's requiring us to go outside of our comfort zone and do the things that we wouldn't normally do in order to preserve life as we know it on Mother Earth's belly. And so whatever that is, I mean, I'm the kind of person where I have stood on a street with a sign by myself regularly in my younger days and waited for people to join and they joined so this this time that we're in right now it requires that kind of of courage and and moving beyond the fear that we have of putting ourselves out there and other people will come because people understand in their beingness that this is a critical time they see what's happening yeah thank you so much penny and I, I would, uh, oh. Malik, why don't you go and then Mickey, I think we might have to cut it because I want to do one last closing before we end at the top of the hour. Go for it, Malik. I, I, would, I would encourage on a local level identifying groups that have been impacted by recent flooding or some other kind of environmental issue who may not have actually organized yet and just talk to them, the community residents, the homeowners about um, building better infrastructure, changing policies and codes that would uh, uh, give them a better opportunity to respond when the next flood comes or when the next natural disaster hits. Uh, that's one way to get people locally involved who have not been involved uh, with climate justice uh, in the beginning. Thanks, Malik. Um, okay, so I have one last ask for you all before you close the call. Thank you everyone who's typing into the chat, who uh, answered all the questions. We will follow up with you and plug you in. Um, and I have one more ask for y'all, which is uh, Avery is going to share uh, the link for a beautiful poster that was created by um, 
uh, by Claudio Martinez, uh, who's a Milwaukee-based artist and designer. He's part of uh, Voces de la, los Artistas, which is an art affinity group for the Wisconsin-based immigrants' rights organization, Voces de la Frontera. Um, so we want everyone to share this on their Facebook or on their social media to really build the hype. Um, and I'm also seeing that there is one last quick poll, which is if you are interested in planning an action and you don't have one on the map yet, please select yes and we'll follow up with you individually to offer support. We have a bunch of staff people from different organizations that are helping to support all of the actions across the, across the country. So uh, go into the chat, um, share that graphic um, on your Facebook wall and build hype for, for this action. And please continue to stay tuned to RISE, plug into your local action, follow up with us if you have any questions. And I just wanna say um, a really heartfelt thank you to all of the speakers on this call who took time out of their days and who are working so hard to organize these events and uh, organize our communities for, for climate justice. So thank you so, so much for joining us. And thanks to everyone on the phone at home who called in to help plug into the Save Action. We're really excited to work with all of you and we're really excited about what's gonna happen in the lead up on September 8th and the work coming out of that. So thanks everyone. Have a great night. Bye.